equations. Um, and then finally, talk about a measure of computational time, okay? So I guess a motivation uh, first is why should we bother about systems of linear equations? Uh, the motivating example in the book was uh, polynomial interpolation. So the idea is that you have a set of points, okay? A set of points and you want to fit a polynomial through those points, but it's a little bit different from the usual polynomial regression. Uh, it's more of like polynomial interpolation in the sense that if you, let's say you have two points, you the, the highest degree polynomial that you can fit through those two points would be a line. And if you have three points, then you have a quadratic, a quadratic and so on, okay? So the idea is to really trace, to connect the dots, okay? So that's uh, how I would uh, interpret uh, polynomial interpolation, which is a little much different from uh, what you may have encountered in polynomial regression. Uh, the chapter emphasizes numerical issues that are usually not encountered when solving by hand, okay, or at least in toy problems encountered in um, in a math class, let's say, that doesn't emphasize numerical aspects. So you will see instances of near non-invertibility and how it creates uh, problems. And then this notion of subtractive cancellation also shows up here as well. Uh, so there's a loss of accuracy uh, when you add and subtract uh, two number, other, add or subtract two numbers that have like very high precision Okay. number the number of significant digits is large but when you add and subtract them the the resulting number has lower uh precision as a result so you'll see that too here in this uh in this chapter okay so just so we're on the same page about the the key theory the theory is really i would say very straightforward and it focuses on just solving for x in this kind of system okay so the book uh uses bold face for all of the matrices and vectors okay and a is an n by n matrix x and b are n by one vectors uh the task is to solve for x in this kind of system and then this kind of system the solution is to really just put a on the other side okay so kind of like solving scalar type equations so to put it on the other side, we multiply by the inverse of A, okay? And it's easy to do this if, you know, like in the mind, you know? So in, in practice, it's much more difficult because it could be very difficult to compute A inverse. Uh, I don't remember the formula. I usually have to do this by guesswork if I'm in a two by two, but if you have three by three, four by four, it gets worse. Okay, uh, and uh, I guess this will be busy work for for some classes, no? but yeah, it takes really a lot of time to figure this one out. Okay, so there has to be a way out uh, to deal with uh, the inversion of that matrix A. Uh, so the idea is that it should be easier to solve a linear system if there's some structure to A. So if there's a structure to A in the sense that you have zeros in strategic places, then maybe it's easier to solve the system of equation, a system of linear equations. So an example would be something that looks like uh, that looks like this. So you have x one is equal to zero, uh, and then x one plus x two is equal to one. And you could represent this system of linear equations. You could represent the system of linear equations uh, in terms of a matrix form and it would look like a times x is equal to b, okay? So here you would see that this matrix here has a zero here on, uh, above the main diagonal. So this part here is the main diagonal, okay? And this part here above is, uh, you, you see a zero there. Uh, when you have this kind of matrix, this is what, it, what is called a lower triangular matrix. So the easier way to remember a lower triangular matrix is that uh, all of the non-zero non-zero entries will be below uh, the main diagonal. Okay, 
of course, there could be some zeros down down below as well, but most of them should be uh, there should be non-zero entries below the main diagonal, and that will be a lower triangular matrix. Okay, so that's the sort of like idea. And then if you if you look at this system, it, you already have a solution for x one equals zero, and then it's just a matter of substituting x one equal to zero to the next equation. So you're moving it forward so that you could get x2 and that would be x2 is equal to one and that this kind of solution or these approach to solving the system of equations that has this special structure is called forward uh substitution uh in the book okay so we could have the other case where you have an upper triangular matrix and then you have backward substitution so that leads to the ideas of uh, forward and backward substitution as a way to solve uh, systems of linear equations that have a particular structure. Okay. Now, of course, uh, it would be great if we have this kind of system all the time, but uh, the reality is that A would be much more complicated. So what, what we want is to somehow get to a point where you have an, a lower triangular kind of matrix or an upper triangular matrix in some through some way okay so the idea in the book is to to say that okay let's try to find what is called an lu factorization of a so a could be written as l times uh u okay and this l times u has a special form as well okay that exploits the fact that we know a lot about forward and backward substitution because they're easy to implement, they're easy to do, okay? So this, as you may notice, there's an and here. So that means that this, this factorization is not unique, okay? So, and you're actually solving a quite complicated decomposition. So you're basically starting with A where you, the entries of A are known, and then you're splitting it up into a product of two matrices where you don't know the entries. Okay. You don't know the entries of those matrices, but you do know that some of the entries of this of this lower triangular matrix are zero, namely those that are above the main diagonal. And for you, you have those entries that are below the main diagonal are, are zero. So the only really unknown uh, entries, uh, the, then there would be fewer of those uh, unknown entries, but still you have to find those. Okay. And there's a normalization that was uh, introduced in the book. And the idea is that uh, with this normalization, uh, the number of entries in A will match the number of unknowns in L times U. Okay. So here you have L would be a unit lower triangular matrix. And what that means is that the main diagonal would be all ones. Okay. And then for the upper triangular matrix, the lower diagonal, sorry, the main diagonal doesn't have to be ones. Okay. So what's the, so why would this be a good thing? It would be a good thing because if A is equal to LU, then you have LU times X is equal to B, okay, by substitution. And then the idea is that this U times X, okay, can be thought, we can write this as Z, okay. You can write this as Z, and then you'll have a system that is lower triangular times a vector of unknowns is equal to a vector of knowns. Okay. So why is Z a vector of unknowns? Because, uh, well, because X is unknown. Okay, we, We're trying to find X. And if you happen to have U, okay, then you have also another system UX is equal to Z with a particular structure for, for U. Okay. So the idea is to solve for LZ is equal to B, solve for Z and LZ is equal to B, okay? So it has this kind of form, L times Z is equal to B, use forward substitution. And then once I know Z, I can now solve for U, X is equal to Z to find X and you use backward substitution there. And that's it. So this is the key, uh, key theory for the chapter, okay? So, Again, easy from the armchair. And then the numerical part is the sort of like the more complicated business. Okay. So just an aside, so I I, I did some uh I tried to incorporate 
Julie into our markdown or uh, in, in this case in Quarto, okay? Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna mention some of the things to do so that in case you're interested in it. So first, of course, you install Julia in the book specific package because we're gonna use some of the commands from, from this uh, package. I, I hope I used the, the term correctly, okay? Uh, the instructions are linked. And then you have to take note of the path to the Julia binary, okay? So you need to find a folder which has this bin, okay? Where you install Julia, okay? And then I use the package called Julia call, okay? Uh, and the latest version uses this, you have to use the, use the latest version instead of the version at, uh, at CRAN, okay? So, so the idea is that first you load the Julia call package after installing it, and then make sure that you point to the Julia binary. So in this case, it's pointing to the directory where you could find the Julia binary, okay? This is what you see in the third line, okay? Uh, and then here, this is a Julia code chunk in in, in Quarto or in our markdown. So instead of like uh, the three, I don't know what, what it's called, but three, accent marks, uh, and then you have R, instead of that, you use Julia, okay? So that's uh, that's essentially the idea, okay? So three accent marks and then the open left, uh, so sorry, the left brace, and then instead of R, you put Julia and so on, okay? And then you go, you, you put into that code chunk, however you want to, wh whatever syntax you know about Julia, and you put Julia, Julia commands there. You could also execute a Julia command inside an R code chunk. And I'll show you an example later, a more substantive example later on. Okay, but here's one example where this part is what you would do in Julia. And then uh, of course the output here is suppressed because of this colon here. Okay, and then you could evaluate uh, what is A uh, in this situation. And this is what you see here, okay? Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll pause here for a while because it's been 15 minutes. So if there are questions, let's see. Okay. Okay. You're, you're doing these slides in Quarto then? Because it's like... Um... What's it called? I forgot now. What's the name? Reveal.js? Is that what you're using? Uh, Reveal.js, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So it should be... it. I, it should be possible to do this in R Markdown as well, but when I knit the R Markdown file, the the fonts are a bit too small, so I just I just decided to just put it in slide form so that it okay nicer. Okay. And, and are there any other questions? Okay, great. Okay, so let's learn Julia through one of the exercises. And this is the this is the motivating example, one of the motivating examples, which is polynomial interpolation. But uh, the book has more the, the book has uh, a more straightforward example. So I selected a less straightforward less straightforward example, uh, just to demonstrate uh, what you could do, uh, and then uh, and then show how to use Julia in the process. So here's the problem. The problem is that you're asked to find uh, a, a QB polynomial in T uh, and C1, C2, C3, and C4 are unknown, okay? With the following properties. When you evaluate P at minus one, it's minus two. When you evaluate P at one, it's zero. Uh, and when you look at the derivative of P, and evaluate it at minus one, you get one. And, it, and if you evaluate at one, it's equal to minus one, okay? So it's slightly different from the one that you see in the section in the book where you're given uh, four points and you fit a cubic polynomial directly, okay? Uh, so the point is to show you that you actually need sort of like four pieces of information, quote unquote, okay? Rather than four points on the, on the curve itself, okay? So, so if you do this by hand, uh, you, you need to get the derivative of P of T. So when you get the derivative of P of T, uh, you'll, you actually have two pieces of information here, okay? 
So that contributes to the system of equations. Okay. So you have four, four equations and four unknowns. Okay. And uh, feel free to check this if this is right, but I think this is right. Uh, and uh, so now you have this polynomial interpolation problem cast as a system of linear equations kind of problem. Okay. And if you use some algebra and it's relatively straightforward, you should get something that looks like this. Okay. Now you could use Julia to do this. And what, what's important is that you need to feed Julia A and you need to feed Julia B and then use something in Julia that will allow you to solve uh, a system of linear equations. That's essentially the idea. So that means that we need to input a vector, a matrix, and know a command for doing the system of linear equation stuff. So to input a vector, uh, you use this uh, square brackets, and then the vector here is a, a column vector. So if you want a column vector, you need to put this semicolon. So you can think of this column as a carriage return, if you wish. Uh, but uh, strangely enough, for for vectors, for column vectors, you could also represent it uh, this way using a comma. Okay. okay. And then you'll and then this will be the output. Okay. And then the A matrix looks like this. So the A matrix is a matrix. So this time you put in the rows one by one. Okay. So you build the matrix one by one, and then you have column as the carriage return. Okay. okay. Uh, unfortunately, the, if you put commas here, this will not work. Okay, or at least if you put one, one minus one, one minus one, and then comma, and then zero, one minus two, three, comma, that won't work. Okay, so that means that this this thing is probably not a, not a, exactly a very good idea. So, just so you have sort of like some sort of like um, uh, continuity of sorts. Okay. An alternative to putting in that matrix. Uh, is to literally do a carriage return, okay? And that's what you see here, okay? And then this part here is how you solve a linear, a system of linear equations uh, in Julia. So you have A and then backslash B, okay? So this does some sort of A inverse B, and then there's a special implementation of the inverse in, in Julia, okay? And you get the exact answers that uh, that I got here, okay. And then you could check whether you got the right answer by looking at b minus a times x. So basically, you check whether a x is equal to b, and uh, I get zeros here, okay. So or you should get some, or you could get something that is comparable to your machine position, okay. So when you do EPS open parenthesis, open left, and then open right uh, parentheses, uh, you should be able to see your machine precision. You should be able to see the machine precision, okay? Okay, so that's it, no? That's it for the, the first part, okay? So now you should we should be able to input vectors, matrices, and then solve the system of linear equations. Now we are gonna go deeper into the box, okay? Uh, to get a sense of the numerical issues okay but before that i'll also introduce plotting so that uh, we, could, we could you already have something to work on um so we now have a cubic polynomial with the desired characteristics so we're supposed to present a visualization so uh the idea is that we need a way for julia to recognize that we have a cubic polynomial so it's accomplished by using the polynomial function. And this is not a built-in, this is not out of the box from Julia. This comes from the package Fundamentals Numerical Com Computation or FNC, okay? And if you notice, uh, I put FNC dot here so that so that I'd be a bit more explicit where, the pa where it came from. So this is kind of similar to, let's say tidyverse colon colon something, okay? Uh, and I also want to represent the, the quadratic, which is where the derivative, okay? And then draw curves over some range and then design the visualization, okay? So uh, so I, I also still put this using here, okay? I think you need to load the package uh, for this to work. Uh, so here you have 
fnc dot polynomial and then x here is the x that we got earlier so these will be the unknown coefficients of the cubic polynomial so you just have to specify uh the vector here so this polynomial function function in fnc uh accepts the vector and this vector is recognized as the constant the coefficient of the linear term the coefficient of the quadratic term and, and so on okay that's the order uh for that and then I also have to encode. So here I also encoded the coefficients of the derivative of the cubic polynomial. And the derivative of the cubic polynomial depends on the coefficients of the cubic. So I need to get certain entries of the x vector. Okay. So this is how you would do the address. Okay. So this is the second entry of the x vector, the third entry of the x vector, and so on. And I think last time Torin also mentioned this curiosity here, where you have two times x, okay, two times x three, okay, we, where you don't put the asterisk uh, explicitly. Okay, and then I could also create the representation of the quadratic here, okay. And then here you see a scatter plot. Uh, but it's sort of like a downer kind of scatter plot because you only have like these two, uh, these two points, minus one and minus two, minus one, minus two, and then one zero. Okay. So essentially you have sort of like the vector of X's, or if you wish the vector of T, okay, the T, the points, uh, on the, on the, hor on the horizontal axis, and then the points on that you will put in the vertical axis so minus two and zero so you can read that at minus one and minus two are paired together one and zero are paired together okay and then this is very a very rich set of options already you have a label a legend uh and then a title okay okay which is relatively similar to what you see in base r plotting okay but what's very curious is uh the labeling where you could use latex uh directly so you can see this L here, okay, where this T, if you don't have L here, you could, this command will still push through, but the T here would be the, the time, sort of like Times New Roman T rather than the late LaTeX T, okay? So, yeah. Uh, another thing that is interesting is this part here where you see the colon, a colon used for the options, okay? Uh, at least that's what I how I how I read this. So that's one of the things to notice. Okay. So this is the scatter plot for for this kind of specification. Okay. And then I need to plot the polynomial over a particular range. So I need to specify the range of t values. So here this is minus one. I I, I created something like a uh, a vector of length. Uh, 500 where minus one and one are included in there. And uh, that's what you see in T range, okay? You could also re you could also specify it as something like minus one colon the step, the step length colon one. You could also do that as well, okay? And then we need the Y values and the Y values are, eval you evaluate the polynomial at all of the values, at each of the values in T range. Okay. And you would notice uh, another thing that is interesting, which is this dot here. Okay. So when you see this dot, it means that you're supposed to evaluate the polynomial at every point inside T range, at every entry of T range. So this is kind of like element Y, I would interpret as element wise evaluation. Okay. So when you have this dot, that's what it does, at least in this context. And you will see it in a different context as well later. Okay. And you do the same for the for the derivative. And I'm just plotting the I'm just plotting the cubic polynomial for the moment. So this is the, the plot. Okay. Okay. And nice thing again is this L, and then you have this P of T here. It looks much nicer. Okay. And then I'll put also the same thing. I want to superimpose the plot. On the on the previous scatter plot, the information from the derivative. Okay. So I also have those two points from the derivative. 
So I also have to use a scatter command for that. And then I also have uh, these uh, options here, okay? Okay. And the interesting thing here is this exclamation point, okay? So this exclamation point, I would interpret as appending or concatenating if, if, if you wish, okay? So that's the idea, okay? So I want to superimpose uh, into the previous plot, okay? And similarly, when I plot the derivative and I want to see it in the in the same uh, graph as before, I also use this uh, exclamation point. Okay, so that's essentially the sort of like a sense of what it looks like, and you would see all the information is uh, is here. Okay, so what what is learned about Julia so far as of this stage? Uh, you know how to represent vectors, matrices, some operations, some interesting things about the the code is that you have the dot for element wise computing it could also be used for package specific commands in the sense of F fnc dot something okay uh and then you have this exclamation point which is for appending or for uh, latching on to something existing okay and then you have this uh colon which i think is for options okay at least in the context of plotting but you also use it in row and column access later. Okay. And, and some basic plotting. And I think there's a lot you could do already from here. Uh, you have this nice latex, sorry, latex uh, type uh, approach here. And then you have different options for the lines and so on. Okay. Uh, I think I'll, I have to pause here. So are there questions so far? Uh, hey, Andrew, sorry, that's all right. Yeah. Video on. I'm, I'm Josh, by the way. I don't think of, um, I know Torrent, but I haven't met Ron or Andrew. So nice to meet you guys. Yeah, nice to um, meet you. I think I can add a little bit of a, a clarity to the exclamation mark and, and colon. Um, <clears throat> so in Julia, I think it's called a bash. Um, and it's generally reserved for um, functions that will append their arguments. So it's not like if you have a function that you write you can't just call function name with an exclamation mark and it'll automatically append. You have to have a second method that has that function name with an exclamation mark. So it's like an extra, um, it's a second function, basically. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I saw in the help command as well that if you, let's say, if you do question mark plot, you'll see plot and plot exclamation. Something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks and then the, the colon is reserved for, I think what's called symbols. So like um, um, dash is like a reserved, like a keyword basically. Um, so colon dash is like a symbol and it it calls all this other functionality. And it's the same thing with like the row column axis like you have there. Like um, if your column is named X, that's now a symbol within that like data frame. And so that's like a reserved operator. And I think that's what it's um, referring to. I don't know if that helps a bit, but. Yeah. Uh, so. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. So I didn't go deep into the sort of like architecture, yeah. the whole thing. So the book is sort of like it, it throws you into the into the it totally does the mess, right? And then you <laughs> and then you yeah. sort of try to figure out using your sort of like some intuition. <laughs> Absolutely. But I just remember like um when I first came across like the exclamation part, I wasn't really sure what it was for. And, and the, the word is bash. Um so if you're if you look that up then. So it's called bash. Yeah, B A S H. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I think I think symbol for for a colon like the word symbol. So I see. Thank you, thank you, Josh. Yeah. Any any other comments or questions? Um, I appreciated your explanation of the matrices. I was just before this call trying to figure out the whole like arrays with commas and no commas and the semicolon. So on the help page for the semicolon, it says it does vertical appending. Okay, great. So, because I was very confused about one of their examples where they defined the X, like a, a column vector X, and then, um, yeah, right above that, I think. Let right above see. this. 
Ah, this one. Yeah, go down a little bit. Okay, let's see. It was actually in section 2.2, .2, in demo 2.2.1. Okay. Um, they have the array that's, yeah, those two lines. I <laughs> The X, X with no semicolon, and then the X, semicolon X. Yeah. I was just very confused <laughs> until yeah. I yeah, read the help page, and then it made a little more sense. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that. Uh, so I, I didn't read, I tried not to read the help page. I tried to figure out what's going on first and then, and then I, because it, it, it really throws you into the, you know, into the mess and then you, you sort of like, think, <laughs> yeah, I think your advice to be more consistent using the semicolon would not have made that so confusing because if they would have defined X with semicolons instead of commas <laughs> might have been right. more obvious <laughs> yeah the thing is that so so i i guess the so the, some of these punctuation marks are used in different like in many ways like the semicolon could also be used to add to sort of like uh suppress the output from julia right so it's it's all over the place it's uh yeah <laughs> thanks for that so i i guess we could move on Okay, great. So the next uh, the next uh, example that I have is to learn Julia through exercise 2.3.7. So here it's a demonstration of the subtractive cancellation issue. And at the same time, I show you how to sort of like uh, some of the sort of like the neater commands that they have, but they're not out of the box, okay? so. So this is the system of linear equations that you see here. And uh, this is easy to solve using uh, back substitution. This is an upper triangular matrix, okay? And uh, you're supposed to, we're supposed to look into how uh, va relative values of alpha and beta affect sort of like the accuracy of the results, okay? So that's essentially the idea for this exercise, okay? So we need a way to throw in A and to throw in B and then solve the system of linear equations, okay? So if you solve this, solve for x by hand, then you could, it's easy to solve that, find that x1 up to x5 are all equal to one. And then that's the analytical solution using backward substitution. But there's a big loss of accuracy and I'll demonstrate, it. We'll, we'll see that in a moment, okay? So the, the book tells us to use the built-in, sorry, the 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 function two point three point five, which is in the in section two point three, and the function is called back sub, okay, to solve for x with alpha equals 0 0.1, set at 0 0.1, and beta set at these uh values, and then you're asked to tabulate the values of beta and the I think this is called the absolute accuracy, okay, again from from chapter one, okay. So if you want to do this, uh, you would need to repeatedly do back substitution for different values of beta. So one thing you could, so you could introduce looping here. And at the same time, to represent this exponentiation, so you can think of this as 10 to the one, 10 to the two, 10 to the 12. So we could do this in one go, okay? And we could use element-wise exponentiation over some range, okay? And we need to input the A matrix and the book does it in a very different way. And it introduces something that is not out of the box as well, okay? We could do this without uh, using diag M, but yeah, I, I show this because this is something that you see in the, in the book. And then you use back sub to solve for X and then tabulate the results. So that's what the pseudo code would kind of look like, okay? So here's uh, one version of the code, uh, the ugly version. So the ugly version is uh, I have alpha is equal to 0.1. And then here you have this element-wise exponentiation. And this is the range, 1 to 12, OK? okay. And that would be your beta, OK? And then you have uh, for, and then you write down your loop, OK? So for, for beta in beta, OK? So the beta here is a little bit different from the beta here, OK? The beta here is this beta. And then this beta is sort of like a generic one. You see this kind of um, 
a style in the section as well, like for N in N. Okay. So it and doesn't then, save over. Sorry? It doesn't replace yes. the object. As far as I understand. As far as I understand it, this is sort of like a generic one, and this is the one that you that is referred to here in line three. Yeah. Okay. So the X matrix, the finding X is easy because you just use the back sub and then you put in the matrix A and then the, the vector B. Okay. Uh, uh the A matrix is that you have a diagonal matrix. Okay, you start with a diagonal matrix. And then you have to replace, for a diagonal matrix, uh, the default is that the main diagonal is all the ones and then everywhere else is zero. And then what you need to do is to replace those, some of these zero entries with this minus one, minus one, minus one, and then alpha minus beta and beta, okay? We could do this directly by using the address, okay? So first row, second column, replace my, with minus one and so on. But that will be many lines of code. And what the book does is, to use this sort of like equal greater than symbol uh, to do this kind of um, replacement in a much neater way. And this pairing here that you see here, so I, I use the word pairing now because it's, it's actually called a pair object, okay? So what it does is sort of like uh, you have a, something here and it's replaced by something here, or, or not really replaced, but it's paired, okay? And then depending on the situation, it gets replaced, okay? At least that's how I understood it. So now let me just demystify what this zero, one, three, and four means, okay? The, the zero here is the main diagonal, okay? The zero here is the referring to the vector uh, on the main diagonal. The one here is the one that is above the main diagonal. So it's one above the main diagonal, and then three will be the this one. So one, two, and then three, and then four. Okay. So that's the idea here. Okay. And the the zeros here are replaced by ones, okay, a, a vector of ones. Okay, five elements. And then here you have four elements for minus one, minus one, minus one, and then two elements here, and then one element for this one. Okay. So that's the sort of like a, simp a simplifying, instead of typing so many things, this, this is what the book does. Uh, and I think I made a boo boo earlier. Uh, I should have said that the default for Diag M is a diagonal matrix with ones on the main diagonal. Uh, because here you see zero, be, the main diagonal being replaced by a vector of ones. Okay. But essentially, that's how this A is constructed. And then you have a loop here with a four and then an end part here. And then I show, so to show the results, it's at show show this vector, okay, the value of this vector. And uh, one thing of note is that I use the absolute value command that's also, this is built in. And then I need to put a dot here so that this will be floating point. Otherwise you'll run into a problem. You'll have an error if you don't have this dot here, okay? And see, as you can see, as the value of beta increases, you see the loss of accuracy, okay? So that's the, this is the subtractive cancellation at work. Okay. And then the prettier version is this one, okay? The prettier version is sort of like you have a nice table that looks like this. And, um, but it uses the same code. The only difference this time is that I need a way to store uh, the absolute value of X1 minus one. Okay, I need to store that. And here, I I don't think it's stored anywhere. Okay, so I stored it into an empty. So this this is I think called an any object. So this is like a just a container, an empty container, and you could put anything in it, uh, as far as I understood. And then there's a there's a command here called push, which is you put it into that 
uh, that thing here. And then you concatenate or append, okay? Without overriding the previous uh, entries, okay? So you'll see this code, I think, in section 2.5, if, if I'm not mistaken, but I put it here so that you could see it uh, earlier. Okay. And then you have pretty table, which I'm not sure if this is built in, but I think this is part of fun, of FNC, but I, I, I have yet to figure, I, I, I forgot to put this, uh, look into this. And then you have this essentially, okay? Now, I just want to point out one thing about uh, working in our studio with Julia. When I type symbols like this, beta or alpha or x sub one, I couldn't, I couldn't type it directly. So I had to copy and paste it from the Julia console. So when I type slash beta escape or something or tab, I, I forgot, but yeah, there's a keystroke to make it beta. So if you put slash beta, uh, it will turn into the beta symbol after some keystroke. And uh, I couldn't do it in R Studio as far as I noticed. And I couldn't also do X sub one there. So I had to do it in the Julia console and then copy and paste it into R Studio. So that's the weird thing here. I don't know if there's a solution there or if this is uh, an issue that will be faced, that is faced by everyone, okay? Yeah, I think that's it for this part. Uh, I'll pause here again. Uh, are there questions, comments, or remarks? Okay, great. So that's that's this part, okay? And then you might ask, what is this back sub command? Okay, so the 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 code is available in the in the book. But but the idea is like this is for upper triangle for systems of linear equations with upper, upper triangular matrix that you see here, and you could already see that there are numerical issues right. You could face numerical issues right away, especially if the main diagonal entries have zeros or near zero entries. Okay, because you'll be dividing by. So for example, for the last uh, row here, you'll be dividing by u sub forty four. Okay, the fourth row fourth fourth column entry of u. And if this is near zero, this will explode, okay? So this is a problem. And uh, you also have issues like subtractive cancellation, which you saw earlier, because this is an upper triangular matrix, okay? And if you want to know what's inside back sub, it's really implementing a version of this analytical solution but in a more, uh, in a way that you exploit the patterns, okay? So the idea is that the analytical solution looks like this, but instead of really like programming the command as if you're looking into the last entry of the B vector divided by the last row, last entry of U, uh, it would be done in a much more, in a much nicer way, okay? And the idea is to realize that there's a pattern here you see four, four, and four. You see three, 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 and three here. Okay. Similarly for two and one. Okay. So those subscripts uh, would help in the looping part. Okay. And then the other thing is that it seems that I always have to subtract something. Okay. I have to subtract a sum. Okay. A sum of sorts. Okay. So that's sort of like the idea behind uh, function 2.3.5. So let me just uh, put it up here. Function 2.3.5, you see? So you would see that, let me put it bigger, okay? So you would see that uh, there's an initialization first, okay? A storage space. And then afterwards, you, you input the first, you, you start, okay, which is get x the last uh, entry of the x vector, and then you you loop through it, okay, you you loop through it backward. That's why you have this kind of uh, step range, which is going backward, and then you have summing up things, okay, okay, summing up things and then subtracting it, okay. They all have that pattern b minus a sum, 
divided by uh, the, the, the entry on the main diagonal. So that's what you would see as a pattern here. Okay, and that's how it was implemented there. And the new thing, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, there's, there's really nothing new here, except for probably this sum here, which is written in a much more natural way. It almost mimics the summation notation that we, that we know, like the sum of all of the uij times xj from j equals i plus one up to n. Okay, so it mimics it more naturally. Yeah, so those are sort of like the uh, the new things that you see there, uh, and you also you would also see some uh, how to access entries of a matrix and so on. Okay. So so far, that's a lot from from Ju from from the Julia side already. Okay. Okay, I think I have to pause again. So, uh, are there any questions or comments? Okay. So in the remaining time that I have, I think I'll only be able to do writing functions. Okay, writing functions. For, for the context that you see in section 2.4, okay? Which is, I'm gonna, uh, we're, we're gonna look at an LU factorization, but we're not going to the details of what an LU factorization is yet. We'll accept that there's an LU factorization out there and there's a command like that out there. And the command is, in, it's written in such a way that the L would be a unit lower triangular matrix, which again, as you recall, it would be main diagonal containing ones and then an upper triangular matrix U, okay? But the exercise is asking you to flip that instead, make you a unit upper triangular matrix instead. Okay? That's the normalization that you want. And then L, leave it as a freer lower triangular matrix, okay? And the idea is to you to create a new function using a function that was given to you, okay? And without modification. So this is a simple way to introduce writing a function. So I start with A equals LU and the, the, the mathematics behind it is that if I take the transpose of this matrix, it's really U transpose, L transpose. And what a transpose does is, is that it flips every column into a row, okay? So, that means that if you have an upper triangular matrix, if you take the transpose, it becomes a lower triangular matrix, okay? So essentially the idea is that uh, we can think of, we can use the LU fact command on A transpose instead, so that U transpose will be a, a unit lower triangular matrix, and then we undo the transpose to have a U to have something that is uh, uh, unit upper triangular. Okay, that's the idea. Okay. So here I used a matrix property in case you're not aware of it. It's, it's the, if you take the transpose of our product, it's the product of the transposes in the reverse order. Okay. So here's the implementation of the function, okay? So I use the LU fact function directly without modification, okay? And I apply it to A transpose. So the function is the name and then the argument. The argument is A and A has to be, we have to take the transpose, which is represented by a single code, okay? And then this LU fact, if you dig into LU fact, returns two things, a lower triangular matrix, a unit lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix. So what I did here was to put it in UT, the first lower triangular matrix, put it in UT, which is U transpose. And then this is L transpose. And then afterwards return. Uh, so what I do is I sort of like, I undo the operation, okay. And I have the matrix A here, and then I apply LU fact, and then here's what I what I get. Okay, so I now have a unit upper triangular matrix uh, LU factorization uh, for the A matrix. So that's the idea, and then this this last part is just uh, a check. 
Okay. And then you could also do, you could use, you could write another function called the determinant function, which is in exercise 2.4.6. And again, there's a, uh, I'm going to use LU fact directly. Okay. And the property that we're using is that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. Okay. For, for square matrices, of course. And then, and then another determinant property that we're going to use is that the determinant of a triangular matrix is equal to the product of the diagonal entries. Okay. Uh, this makes things easy because if L is unit lower triangular, the main diagonal contains ones. So the product is just one. So that means that the determinant of A is just the determinant of U. And this is nice because uh, I, I think it's, you wouldn't wish it on someone to to really literally calculate this determinant by hand, okay? Especially if it's a large matrix, unless it has a special structure, which like this lower triangular matrix that you see here, okay? So the determinant of this general matrix here, square matrix here, is re is really just the determinant of the upper triangular matrix of a, of an LU factorization, which is quite neat, okay? And you pretty much go through it in the same way. You have the name, the argument, you, the fact that you use LU factoriz the LU factorization function that is in the in the book. It's expecting two things. I call them L and U. And then I need to get the product of the diagonal entries. I think this is the part that is new in the uh, is not in the in the book. Okay. So I need the diagonal entries of U, and then I have to take the product of the diagonal entries of U. Okay. And then return this debt U. Okay. And then and then the exercise also asks us to compare it with the built-in determinant function uh, in Julia, and we get something similar. Okay, uh, I didn't stress test this with uh, malevolent uh, matrices A, no, but uh, we could do that. I think I don't have time anymore, so I have to stop here. Yeah, this is really great. I like the way you structure your slides. <laughs> yeah, these are really good. Um, so I, I don't know how much more you have left? Like for next time, do you want to? Yeah, I think I'll start? continue time with looking inside the LU factorization, but I think I only need about maybe thirty minutes. I think, but uh, but I don't. It depends on you. If if you want to continue with the next section, feel free. You no, know? oh. uh, because there's the slides are already there. Yeah, for oh. up, at least for my part, up to two point five. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you can share with somebody next week. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Does anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I'll bug some of the people, and if not, I can do the second half next week. Yeah, so uh, so I could I could do one part. So this LU factorization stuff, uh, and then end with computational time. Uh, I I guess I'll uh, the last the very last slide has some of the eccentricities that uh, that I noted down so might be interesting for some of you I mentioned this x1 already uh, the other eccentricity is this one where if I put the comment on top this one gets suppressed but if I put this on the side it doesn't get suppressed so this is an eccentricity so that's something of note <laughs> Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm going to type end here. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was really great. Um, Thank you, everyone, for listening as well and for your patience. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah, very clear. Yeah. Well done. All right. See you next week. Thank you. Joshua, thank you as well for your comments. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Bye. Bye. Bye.